In 2011, alternative fuel vehicles made up 4.2% of Norway's new car sales. In 2020, that number screamed up to 83.5%. Watch out world, this will happen to you next. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Watching a recent video by Best in Tesla, hey Lars, great show, I was struck by the graphic shown here. It shows the relative percent sales by vehicle type in Norway over the past 10 years. Now, Norway is a small country and thus car sales are pretty small too. In 2020, 141,412 cars were sold in Norway. That's less than 0.3% of global car sales in 2020. But Norway is also a very forward-leaning country working hard to become a carbon-neutral, renewable energy country by around 2040. But why does all this matter? Because Norway jumped from 4.2% alternative fuel vehicles in 2011 to 83.5% AFV vehicles in 2020 in just 10 years. And battery electric vehicles went from 1.4% in 2011 to 54.3% last year. That means that battery only powered vehicles are making up more than 50% of new vehicle sales in 2020 in Norway. As a little side note, note that in 2020, the Audi e-tron outsold the Tesla Model 3 in Norway. But Norwegians love their SUVs, and the Model Y was not available in Norway in 2020, and supply of the Model 3, S, and X were also severely constrained during much of the year. I expect Tesla will dominate there as soon as the Model Y is available, and Giga Berlin is able to deliver cars to Norway more seamlessly. The balance of alternative fuel vehicle cars, by the way, is made up from hybrid cars, where the engine recharges a large battery, and from plug-in hybrids, which are the same as hybrids but with a larger battery, so you can plug them in at home overnight to charge around 50 miles or 80 kilometers before the gas engine has to start working. Thus, for daily driving, one can drive a plug-in hybrid completely on battery power, never using the gas engine. Hybrids went from 2.8% in 2011 to 8.8% in 2020. These are clearly stopgap cars on the way to all electric and hit their peak of 12.9% back in 2017 in Norway. Plug-in hybrids were at 0% through 2013 because they didn't really exist until 2014 and have climbed steadily since then to 20.4%. So of the cars that can drive all on battery for most needs, percent sales went from 1.4% in 2011 to 74.7% in 2020. That means that three quarters of new cars sold in Norway will normally use batteries for daily commute. What's perhaps just as intriguing as these figures is that half of Norway's top companies are energy-based companies. One is hydropower, but the other four are oil-based energy companies. This means that Norway's consumers are moving away from oil-based cars while their biggest companies depend on that for revenue. All of these factors should be a wake-up call to the rest of the world. Why, you say? Norway has a tiny population with under 0.3% of global auto sales. Why should the world at large care? Well, let's think about that in just a minute. But first, if you enjoy this episode, definitely like it so other people can find it because that's how YouTube works and also subscribe for more of this. Also, a big shout out to all my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much. I have a prize for you. In fact, by the time this video comes out, it should already be there. You'll have early access to our merchandise store, which has a really awesomely designed, at least I think so because I designed it, t-shirt. So look forward for that and definitely join Patreon. Look in the description for the link if you want early access to that t-shirt. Also, as always, a big thank you to Zenly Music for doing the intro and conclusion music definitely look him up on youtube or instagram he's awesome and if you're in the market for a new tesla definitely check out our referral link in the description if you click on that link in the description we each get a thousand free supercharger miles which is great if you look in the description and click on the link for the amazon affiliate in your country and you order something within the next few hours then we get a small commission which really helps the channel out so thank you so much all right so why should the world at large care what's happening in little old but very beautiful norway because norway is beautifully demonstrated demonstrating the S curve and the tipping point. If you haven't seen my video on the S curve, definitely check it out here. So people don't think I'm not giving proper credit where it's due. The S curve has been discussed by Tony Saba for years and ARK Invest's analysts discuss it all the time as well. So this is not my idea by any means, I'm just relating it. Let's take a start by looking at a chart that shows all vehicle sales for Norway mashed together in one chart. As you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on back and forth and there's a big blue line that's going up and that is the alternative fuel vehicle. So we will abstract that 
that out now and look at the next graph. This one shows much more clearly. This has the downward trending line is the gas diesel engine, so gas powered in general, and the upward trending line, which is gaining speed rapidly, is all alternative fuel vehicles, including standard hybrid cars. So here you can see the relative trends, and you can also see that if we overlay an S-curve on top of this, 2013 was the tipping point year. It was the point at which the graph shows a steady, nearly linear increase over time. And note, even now, this trend is still nearly linear. It will have to tail off eventually, perhaps next year, as it approaches 100%. But at that point, we're into the tail of the S-curve, with late adopters and those that simply have to use oil-based cars for one reason or another still purchasing those type of cars, but everybody else purchasing battery or other alternative fuel vehicle type cars. It's unfortunate that we don't have access to say like 2001 to 2010 because I think it would more clearly show the start of the S curve where it's very flat and just you know zero to one percent or so for a long period of time. So that would be the start of the S curve. And of course what it would show is that from around zero percent in 2001 alternative fuel vehicle sales rose very gradually to 4.2% in 2011 and that would be the start of the S curve or the early adoption phase. And now let's look at the battery electric vehicle or BEV growth chart specifically. In 2011, 12, and 13, we saw releases of cars like the Nissan Leaf and the Tesla Model S, which obviously started to ramp electric car sales. 2015 and 16 had no real breakthrough BEVs, so the curve is kind of flat. And then it rapidly ramps after that due to more interesting mass market BEV cars for sale. But one can also look at 2016 as the tipping point and sales since then as the main adoption phase. In that case, all BEV sales up to 2016, which hit around 15% of all vehicles, so still a very small fraction, are the early adopter phase. I like looking at it this way. Look at just how straight that graph is or how linear the graph is after 2016. This is just classic S-curve adoption. And more scarily for anybody out there not making BEV specifically, it's right in the middle of this linear phase because it's at about 54% or so, meaning there's another four or five years of linear growth before it starts to tail off as sales near 100%. What does this all mean? First, you can already see that standard, not plug-in hybrid sales are going down now, just like gas diesel sales. In other words, BEV sales are eating hybrid sales now too. And this will likely happen, indeed it has to happen for linear BEV growth to continue with plug-in hybrids as well. You can see from their growth that this growth hit its big growth phase from 2014 to 17, and sales of plug-in hybrids have been fairly flat since then. I actually expect those numbers in Norway to start to fall next year as BEV sales eat up their market share as well. This positions Tesla and VW and their ilk in particular as prime players in Norway as they have BEV cars to sell. Who's going to get hurt? Well, all internal combustion engine or ICE car makers and even the likes of Toyota who've based their alternative fuel vehicle strategy on hybrid cars rather than battery electric vehicles. So what does Norway tell us about the rest of the world? Well, car sales last year were about 61.9 million. This is a scary big drop actually from the 71.9 million in 2019. There are of course mitigating factors like especially a pandemic crushing auto construction and sales last spring and early summer. In the U.S., every car manufacturer saw massive losses except for Volvo, Mazda, and Alfa Romeo, which saw tiny gains, and Tesla, which saw a massive 20% growth in sales last year. This is more or less reflected in global numbers, though I can't find final numbers for the entire planet just yet for 2020. What was Tesla's market share last year sales-wise? About 0.8%, practically a rounding error. What were BEV sales in Norway in 2011? Oh yeah, 1.4%, practically a rounding error. So can we expect BEV sales globally to be around 55% in 2030? No. I actually think that number is highly conservative. I expect we will see the trend to look the same as what it looks like in Norway, but it will be at a much faster pace for two main reasons. Number one, people are not going to go through the hybrid phase. They've already done that globally, and hybrids will not gain traction as much as in Norway. A lot of this is just technology. In 2011, there were not many alternatives to hybrids when it came to cleaner cars. I know we bought a Prius hybrid in 2010, and that was about the best choice at the time. Plug-in hybrids will increase somewhat, but again, I expect them to have their lunch eaten by fully battery-driven cars. Essentially, you have the worst of both worlds with a plug-in hybrid. You're dealing with the expense of building a battery, and one that's actually pretty dinky as well, plus the expense and maintenance 
maintenance and care of an oil-based engine. This is a ton of work to create a car that's only halfway successful being a gas-driven car or a battery-driven car. So plug-in hybrids too will fall by the wayside more rapidly now that BEVs are a more mature technology. And point two, autonomous driving will at some point drive down auto ownership, causing the market to contract rapidly. Let's say that in 2025, regulators in most countries approve robo-taxi. By 2027, people will start to realize that spending a ton of money to own, maintain, and insure their own car is much more expensive than just calling up a car whenever it's needed. At that point, car sales will plummet because car usage rates will go way up. Rather than using a car, say, 10% of the day, it might be used 75% of the day. Thus, for the same number of rides, you need around five or six times fewer cars. So by 2030, the entire market for cars might shrink to 30 or even 25 million vehicles. And hey, as opposed to making around 60 or 70 million battery packs per year, which is difficult, the industry will then only have to make around 30 million instead. That is much easier to manage. And BEVs will be cruising up the S-curve line at the same time. So by 2030, the auto market could well be half or less the size it is now, and BEVs will cost less than ICE cars then, and the S adoption curve will be reaching the tail end of the S curve with only late adopters coming on board then. So by 2030, ICE cars might be just a couple of percent of auto sales or a rounding error. Plug-in hybrid cars might make up like, so let's say 10% or so of the market and around 85% of car sales will be battery electric vehicles by 2030. But you say, isn't big auto too big to fail? And won't people support their oil-based economies? Not if Norway has anything to show about that. Again, four of their top 10 companies are oil-based companies, and that has not stopped them at all from rapidly adopting non-oil-based automobiles. As for whether big auto is too big to fail, that depends on governments. I would hope that none will prop up failing companies simply due to history. It's actually kind of sad, like thinking about an older person who relives their glory days in high school because that was the, you know, the highlight of their lives. And also supporting failing companies is extremely counterproductive. As for will people continue to support the oil-based economy, Norway again can help us answer that question. Even with 40% of their top companies being oil-based, the country is rapidly moving to battery electric vehicles. So it doesn't appear to matter to consumers what their country's main industry is. They will go with BEVs as soon as it's environmentally and economically beneficial to them. The big takeaways here are that the S adoption curve functions in real life as Norway shows, and that the rest of the world needs to pay very close attention to Norway. Stock investors should take note of this and invest properly. Do your own research, of course. I am not a stock analyst, as I've said many, many times, so don't take my word for it. Do your own. Also, consumers should pay attention. You don't want to buy an expensive new ICE car in a year or two, only to find it worthless as the world moves away from ICE cars. And as for auto companies, they should throw every penny they have and more into moving to BEVs as fast as humanly possible, all while drawing down their factories and workforces in preparation for the decimation of their entire industry. Interestingly enough, I just heard that Daimler Group just cut their workforce by a massive amount, or they're trying to do that by like, I think 30,000 engineers. Maybe they've realized what's coming and they're trying to start to draw down their workforce in preparation for a contracting market. Anyway, overall, this is a vicious reality for traditional auto companies, but not facing it will not do them any good at this point. They either need to make massive sacrifices now and have a chance of surviving or just give up. You might not make it by fighting, but at least you'll go down you know, with a fight and there's merit in that alone. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and informative. If you did, definitely make sure you like and subscribe. Also, a really important note, I now have my first employee outside of myself. Daniel Galdron is going to edit some of the videos and he will, of course, get credit for that. I want to thank him very, very much. He's coming on when this channel is really small, so he's not going to be making much money in the near term. So if you enjoy his editing style and you have any editing needs, definitely check out his link in the description. I'm sure he'll be happy to hear from you. In the meantime, definitely ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.